this session is to have taken the, the 20 or so ideas that came out from the tables. We have this uh, extremely Delphic uh, endowed uh, panel here that with great wisdom has selected the top six. And then we're, you're going to hear what those top six were from the panel just in a very concise statement uh, that will be uh, hopefully not completely obscure. Then you will be given a chance to vote uh, and you'll each get one vote. And from that, we'll determine which are the top three, and then we will engage everybody in a little bit more discussion about those top three and end in 40 minutes. Just to preface this, there is no money on the table. <laughs> At least I didn't see any. I don't know. The, this does not have profound ramifications for anything getting funded, anything suddenly appearing in the next uh, you know, grant uh, renewal. Uh, this is really an exercise to get us thinking about some of these concepts. Now, clearly, if something is a brilliant idea that emanates from this, it may trickle through the, the process at CTSI. But just don't feel that all of this has a high-stakes game where we've just done an NIH review in about you know, 20 minutes, and we'll now make a final decision with you as the council uh, in the next 10 minutes. And suddenly, this will have tremendous uh, implications for people's future careers and research projects. OK. Uh, uh, and a lot of this is around not thinking just what's worth for all projects, but the discipline of thinking about how do we think about sustainability and not always just assuming there will be NIH or other grant funding to support this. Okay. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to the panel. Uh, and uh, what we're going to do, Rachel, can you go ahead and display the six? You know, well, let's, let's shoot them up because then people can follow along as they're, they're reading them. Um, all right. People can hear me. So you're going to get one minute, everything you need to know about the initiative from each, each of the panelists. Uh, we will have about two minutes for any clarifying questions, and then we will vote. So let's start with, let's go in the order here. Let's practice. Uh, uh, let's see. Don't vote yet. Don't, don't, don't vote, vote yet. yet. But, <laughs> but uh, all right, first let's go in the order that they are on the screen. First up, San Francisco Health Improvement Partnerships and Personal Technology. Bill Balky. Thank you. So I'm Bill Balky with the uh, our clinical research services component of the CTSI. And this is from table 14, which is a, a really a nice idea that combines two initiatives, biomedical informatics and community engagement in health policy, to collaborate to improve San Francisco health improvement project through personal technologies. The customers are many, including uh, a San Francisco, the entire San Francisco population, particularly tar targeting uh, youth who are more adept at these personal technologies. The impacts uh, are broad, with monetary savings for the city, city and measurable improvements in health, um, and uh, significant reductions uh, in savings on lower rates of obesity and things like that. Ideas for sustainability uh, were uh, support from the city uh, because we have such a budget surplus. Uh, d uh, uh, demonstrate efficiency with the partners. Uh, some of our technology partners might be willing to donate some of the technology. Uh, other potential uh, sources would be the Department of Public Health and other uh, San Francisco departments who would impact on uh, many of these health initiatives that could be targeted with personal uh, uh, devices. Five second warning. That's it. That's it. Perfect. All right. Yeah. All right. Next up, the balanced surgeon. June. All right. Hi, I'm June Lee. I'm the director of early translational research at CTSI, and my uh, the initiative is from Table One, the Balanced Surgeon Initiative. I'm going to rename that a little bit. No, don't uh, vote yet. All right, hold back those <laughs> votes, guys. Somebody's wait. Somebody's premature voting happening out here. All right, All right. hold back, folks. But you can right. if you'd like. Yeah. Right. Go ahead. Dude. <laughs> I'm going to rename that a little bit to call that, that uh, sort of the Device Acceleration Initiative. Um, since the CTSI infrastructure has been has supported clinical trials and clinical research training for the community, but often the surgeons are less engaged in those programs that are available. And so the suggestion here is to, um, to tailor and modify those programs that are currently available to enable more engagement from the surgical community. And that missed opportunity here is that uh, the surgeons that we have bring unique perspectives and expertise that are valued by the outside world, but really actually has potential to impact in patient <coughs> care downstream that's not being fully leveraged. 
Um, the sustainability part would be through um, uh, potentially getting sponsorship opportunities from device companies or other surgical instrumentation sort of companies, but also um, uh, opportunity for co-development collaborative opportunities with those uh, companies and also uh, um, uh, inventions and patents with downstream revenue generation capabilities, as well as the potential to generate uh, bigger NIH uh, grant making opportunities, and then and then really um, uh, 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 the other f other fringe but more important benefit is is uh, enablement of our faculty career growth. All right, thank you. Beautiful. The panelists are doing a great job, and we're not going to penalize. This. They they did three cards instead of one to explain it all, but the and handwriting was so impeccable minute. we accepted all three. All right, next one: early translational research. Okay, oh, that, that's me. Uh, I'm Elizabeth Boyd. I'm the uh, director of the Regulatory Knowledge and Support Program. Um, this proposal comes from Table 19, and the I, I think Table 19 really. Um, um, thought carefully and creatively um, about the uh, presentations that were made this morning, um, and they have really tried to conceptualize an idea that would combine for-profit and non-profit activities. And the, the idea is for um, a, a non-profit organization or entity to be um, developed under the Early Translational Research Group, and that this, this entity would um, facilitate early stage research by partnering um, and bringing together industry partners, researchers, nonprofit uh, patient advocacy groups, et cetera. Um, the, the customers, of course, would include our, our um, UCSF um, researchers, industry leaders, uh, patient groups, as well as the general public. Um, the impact would really be to um, encourage and foster uh, relationships and collaboration with researchers and um, industry partners that would help in, uh, promote and, and advance early stage research, uh, put uh, devoted funds toward that, um, and thereby um, 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 stimulate and uh, promote uh, these developments much earlier and much faster into the, into the public domain. Ten seconds for okay, sustainability um, case. Finally, it would generate industry dollars from, from industry. It would uh, generate in-kind donations and sponsorship from patient advocacy groups. Um, and of course, downstream, there would be um, profits generated from the, the products that were created. Great, thanks. Next, online education. Sally. Online education. Hi, everybody. I'm Sally Mead. I'm the Chief Administrative Officer for CTSI. And um, I'm here to talk about uh, an idea that also came from Table 19, um, the anarchists who submitted more than one idea. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, this is, has to do with the continuing expansion of online education, which is an, an initiative we already have in the works. Um, beyond UCSF to the United States, international implications with this. We can uh, redefine curriculum, readapt, uh, figure out new ways for people to learn. The customer base could really be anybody um, with a state of higher education as it is in the state of California. We could um, think about that or we could try to um, expand our work into developing countries. Uh, kind of the table's wide open and there's lots and lots of opportunity for uh, for growth and development in this area. And uh, revenue generating possibilities are limitless. So, <laughs> right. And varied, and I think the real challenge with online education uh, has to do with figuring out how to tackle it and what our responsibilities are as a public entity to, um, to the world. Good. Brilliant, uh, thanks. Uh, UCSF profiles and public health. Hi. I'm Ralph Gonzalez. I'm the co-director of the program in implementation science that lives within clinical and translational sciences training, CTST. So I'll uh, present to you an initiative uh, to align public health and UCSF researchers uh, through profiles. And uh, the customers here would be the San Francisco Department of Public Health uh, uh, faculty and investigators uh, are not currently within uh, the profiles, and, and so the proposal here is to is to put them into profiles so that UCSF researchers and Department of Public Health can find shared opportunities for funding. Um, the 
the impact is to be on the San Francisco city and county residents as well as the, the faculty and, and investigators. Their idea for sustainability uh, is that basically there could be some funds flowed through successful grant and other contract, uh, contracts that were successfully obtained to support uh, the, the scale up of profiles. Thanks. All right, people, yeah, people are going, so you see how this works. All right, you made, made up your mind. Uh, uh, last, but, but do hear out the final uh, proposal, which is electronic medical records uh, sharing. Uh, Mark. Yes, please hear this one out. This is an important one. Because you can't retract uh, your vote once you've done it. This is, I, I'm Mark you Fletcher. I'm uh, with Consultation Services with CTSI. And uh, this is not a new idea, electronic medical records and, and developing an interconnected EMR that integrates data from UCS, UC medical centers and partners. But it's a really, really important one, I think. It's, uh, this is one of the major things that's changing in our research landscape. And we really, this is a key area where CTSI can help translate what's going on, the health information revolution that's going on right now into better research and therefore, therefore better health. Uh, the, the customers here are UC researchers and patients. I'm gonna just focus that to UC researchers and really think about how we can use the EMR better uh, to, to further research and do research better and more efficiently. For example, by using EMR for recruitment for, and also for using it for obtaining measurements, baseline measurements, follow-up measurements that we usually think we need to s develop a whole new infrastructure to get these other measurements for clinical trials, et cetera, and also for using it for event surveillance, which is something that we also usually have to develop infrastructure for in clinical trials and observational studies. So we, we, this is a big opportunity to, uh, to, to uh, <laughs> help research get better, and it's a very sustainable one because it's fundable, and, and uh, we're paying a lot for it now. We can divert some of those funds to pay for it uh, much more efficiently through this mechanism. Great. Thank you. Okay, uh, Rachel, I mean, I think they've, they've gotten the hang of it, but let, you get one vote, right? Rachel, one you? vote. So. And so the text, you can submit anything, or, uh, or you have to write code? Yeah. So right. for you non-American Idol whizzes out there um, <laughs> who've already started to vote, you can, just one vote, so if you already voted, it's taken. Um, but just to quickly walk you through this. So you'll see, you're gonna be texting a code, so most of you should be, have your phones out by now, you're gonna be texting a code to a five digit number, it's 37607, and what you're gonna be texting is a code, and the codes are given to you, and as you can see, they're on the, the right hand side where the bars are. If you don't have your phone, you actually want to do this over the web, you can go on to um, pollev.com and a little box will pop up and you can vote, you can submit your code on into that box. So as you can see, it's already moving in real time. We have about 63, so actually there's a lot of you that haven't voted yet, but we'll give you a little time to do that. Um, Maybe just also to let you know, so regular text charges apply here. So if some, <laughs> I have lots of dimes. <laughs> it could cost up to 20 cents if you don't have a plan in some carriers. Also know that this, this system is really serious about privacy, so they don't keep your phone numbers. You're not gonna get a follow-up response unless you try to vote twice and then it'll yell at you um, that you can't vote twice. Um, otherwise, I think that's all you need to know and we'll give them a few more seconds to visit. And if you have a question, Ask your neighbor if you're not sure how to vote, or any of you youngsters that are really good at this. <laughs> so cool. <laughs> I know. <laughs> All right, they're moving. Those bars are moving. Uh, give them a few more seconds. All right, and then can, can I just because the next vote is how many want to see a reprieve of Bill Balky doing Running Man from last year's uh, retreat? <laughs> retreat doing the doing. Oh no, that was the sorry. All right, all right. That's just between Bill and me, because because we we were going to get the deans back up to do it again as well, but uh, they they we had to we signed a promise that they wouldn't have to dance again if they came to the retreat. I think that was the deal to get such a good turnout from all the deans. Joe, you could have been initiated as part of a first time dean at this, sorry. All right, the poll, polls are closing. No, no, all right. I'm taking one more, one more right. left. Anyone, any? Okay, we're done. All right. 
Oh man, this is close. Oh wow. man. Oh. We need we need We need a recap. We need did everybody have their ID when they voted? We may need to check some IDs, Rachel, to assure that there was we no fraudulent voting going on here. Wow. Uh, I see it looks do we have the absolute numbers? No. Top four. No, it's a uh, we're gonna do no, all right. Connor Meckle record. All right. I think early translational research and I don't know. This I'm biased on this, so. <laughs> all right, we can try four. Let's see how far we get with four. Okay. Um, so the voters have spoken. Uh, what we're going to now do is take these four, and we have about uh, 25 minutes. And the key is to try to again. We're not going to have then a final vote to say which is the top, but really think through. Uh, and to hear from you all, say, how could, how could these be done in a way that that's, uh, maximizes their impact as well as has a pathway to sustainability? So electronic medical record, uh, Mark, you were last but did it with great feeling and passion that obviously persuaded a lot of folks out there. So uh, Mark, do you have anything you want to add to embellish on what you said already about, about thinking to really what, what's, what's, there's all these EMRs out there both at UCSF, other systems. I mean, what's a funding stream to pull that together in a much more user, usable database, uh, usable uh, infrastructure for researchers? Well, it's a good question, and I, I feel of two minds about this. And I, I think this, for one, could be a very sustainable thing because it's going to add a lot of value to research projects. So as I said, research projects are spending a lot of money on this already. And if we can provide much easier and more efficient ways of gathering the same types of data, <laughs> then uh, we should be able to fund these things very easily. On the other hand, I feel like these things are core pieces of what the university and CTSI, et cetera, should be doing. So I feel like uh, we shouldn't. Charging for it is going to impede, to some extent, the translation. But let's say, so is it like CRS? Is it, is it a mixed model where there's some core infrastructure provided? But you know, you want access to pull some data down. Clay has a project on strokes and wants to see how many of those folks with TIAs show up with strokes over a five-year period, that that investigator should pay, pay yeah, for I, those I data, you know, or access to those data? Yeah, I agree. I think that's reasonable. Have some core funding and to charge for some of it. One of the things, um, I'm a consultation services person, so we could charge for consultation on how to use this or how to set up systems. Mm -hmm for your research project. That would be a way to recoup some of the, uh, okay. some of the costs. OK. Anybody, uh, so anybody out there, any questions? Anybody want to challenge this idea that this has legs? Anybody from the group that was proposing it want to uh, have anything to add about this? Kevin, can I pose yeah, a question? Yes, of course, um, sure. Pose a question to the group or to people from informatics. How does this dovetail or, dis or um, how does this differ from what we're doing with the IDR? the Integrated Data Repository, that, which has already had five years of extensive funding uh, from CTSI. Any folks? Anybody want to speak to that from informatics? Uh, or, to, yeah. One thing I know about the IDR right now is it's internal to CTSF. I know there was a very slow discussion with a group that's trying to uh, aggregate community records and there was a, a brief introductory conversation about introducing an exchange between that community database and the IDR. But right now, the IDR, I think, represents UCSF data. So right, are we, so one question, are we already there with just UCSF medical center data? Are we already, is, is this really about linking with other UC med centers or a health information exchange more broadly among multiple hospitals or providers? Any? Anybody want to speak? To Adams, do you want to speak to that or have something? Uh, to say? Well, actually, we're not very well there okay. yet, so the RDR okay. is still struggling, um, uh, and and it is just UCSF. Um, uh, when we thought about this, I was sort of thinking of this in terms of ideas that would be kind of cool to do. We don't actually have a choice about this. If we want to stay in clinical research, we kind of have to do this. There won't be a lot of tolerance for not being able to do this because as you know if you had a choice as a funder do i pay for this research to happen in a place like kaiser or group health or the acos that are going to form where they can follow a person from soup to nuts or do i want to go to a place at ucsf where they're going to struggle to recruit at ucsf right now where they're going to struggle to recruit and they won't be able to follow them in the outpatient world or whatever um, 
you're just not going to be able to get the funding. So this is a very basic uh, uh, task that we have to do. Would you pay for this as an investigator? For um, I, so I, I, I can imagine an institutional recharge mechanism, and so, somehow it has to get paid for either indirects yeah. or, or uh, on, on clinical research or an institutional recharge. And when people comment, please introduce yourself when you make a comment or have a question. Let's do any uh, one last uh, comment, thought on this, Minnie? Minnie? Uh, so just a question. I'm sorry, I was going to ask a question for others as well. Yeah, yeah, so sure. IDR is UCSF only, and I agree with Adams. That's just a necessity. Um, I, uh, the, but the piece that's interesting is to think about the five uh, UC medical centers and what putting our data together across five institutions provides us that one doesn't. So we go from you know three million okay. records to twelve million. So if you have twelve million records, is that an opportunity for something that maybe three million wasn't? I don't know the answer to it, but I think that's that's a, a possibility. That's something to think about. That's over and above the basic uh, providing us an, an electronic medical record here in an IDR. It's part of what I meant is that if you don't do this, we won't have this. If we don't do this and combine with other people, we won't have the scale. Why would anyone fund us to do something when they could fund Sutter to do the same thing and Sutter has a zillion more patients? So except for very rare diseases where we manage to achieve concentration, you know, pediatric cancers and stuff like that, for the most part, uh, this door will close to us if we don't do this. All right, so let's uh, close on that for now. I think I'm gonna close on, do you have? That's okay. All right, one we, last, please sorry. introduce yourself. Yeah, last. last Hi, one. Kim Kirkwood. Uh, I'm a pancreatic surgeon at, at Parnassus. And uh, we generated the, the idea because we felt that by being able to combine the campuses, it provides opportunities to look at patient populations that in any one center, you can't ask and answer a question because you can't power the study. We felt that it was actually going to really be attractive to investigators, particularly who don't have NIH funding because this is a much cheaper way of accruing patients and asking and answering important questions. And we were thinking about metrics that would both be to improve quality of care, because you could say you wanted to check, say, an albumin level in every patient over the age of 80 who was hospitalized, um, and also to, at that time, study questions that would be related to the same patient population. How does that correlate with functional outcomes, for example? Good. So we felt it was a really okay. powerful way of looking Good. across centers. Good. All right. This one seems uh, fairly clear. And uh, Jonathan and Victoria in the panel with the Clay early on encouraged us to think, who's the end users? I mean, who are our users and engage them? This, the, the users really are the research community, and it sounds like there's a general sense that people are paying for this one way or the other, that there's maybe resources that can be redirected in a more efficient way. Uh, uh, prerogatives of the, the director. Uh, all right, clear, clear. Yeah, so this no, is. I can't mention Colorado. No, nothing about Colorado. So, fabulous idea. Got to do it or we'll die. Got to work across institutions. So, the, the UC Rex project, five campuses coming together, sharing data for research purposes. But the, the key to this is you know, that's $5 million. Sounds like a lot. It's, you know, it's going to be gone before you can blink. And it's going to be inadequate to meet all the needs that you listed. And so then, in thinking about, well, who are the other partners? Well, as you just mentioned, it's also useful for quality of care. It's also useful for operational issues. And in fact, you could save money and make each of the hospitals and medical centers more efficient. And so that's the tactic that we're trying to take to say, OK, medical centers, you're also a customer, and you're a deep-pocketed customer. Can we, go to, would, can we build this with you, meet your needs, and, in, and also address these research needs on the side? And, and so that's kind of the way we've reframed this question to try to, to, to deliver on it. We'll see where it goes. So it sounds like sort of some movement there. Okay, let's, uh, we have three more to go and we'll do quickly. Uh, SF HIP and personal technologies. Bill, you talked about this. So there's, this is around communities with disparities. Maybe it's around physical activity and nutrition. Maybe it's oral health issues. These are the kind of things. Uh, and an app could be put to use. Do you, yeah, do you think people would, uh, I mean, the end users would want it. Is it the community that would, you know, people would want to buy this or they already have it? And that would they buy the app for their diet self monitoring in a low income community for a buck ninety nine to put on their smartphone? Or is it the tech companies we're partnering with? I, I think the answer is all of the above. And yeah. so I want to congratulate Table 14 and please, uh, wherever that table is, uh, if you want to uh, uh, correct anything that I may have misinterpreted, please do so when we get to the questions. But. This is a nice marriage of uh, several of the initiatives of the CTSI to really advance, in my mind, where the rubber hits the road in clinical and translational science, and that's in the community, community engagement and, and its, its larger aspect of health policy. 
And there's actually precedence for this. Uh, in my other life as a cardiologist, there are a number of uh, applications of personal technologies that really help uh, lower recidivism for a variety of rehospitalizations like heart failure. So this is proven to work. And if you do a value calculation on checking of weights and using that to adjust medications rather than come into the emergency room, the savings are astronomical. Uh, we're talking tens of thousands of dollars per year per patient. And this ties right into what Clay just said uh, with respect to the previous topic. The potential funders for these kinds of apps, for these devices that could help monitor the things that our community is concerned about, which is uh, obesity, which is uh, 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 addiction problems, all can be either apps or devices that can connect electronically, medication reminders, any permutation of those kinds of applications have enormous implications for the health and well-being of our community. And the savings that they generate really uh, uh, enables a long list of potential contributors, like, as Clay said, the medical centers would benefit enormously. Emergency room visits would drop. Recidivism would drop. Uh, lots of other manufacturers uh, that do these devices would benefit because their applications could be spread not only through the, the San Francisco Bay Area, but we, this would be a wonderful opportunity to use our incubator here in the Bay as a pr proof of principle for the nation. And I, I can't think of anything that makes my skin tingle more than, than that kind of generalizability which we could accomplish you here. We may make you dance, though, if you really yeah. want but the I, tingle. All right, all right. I'm not, I'm not, yeah, I'm not yeah, being yeah. facetious. Yeah. I really, really yeah. So this is, yeah. so this is really where it, where it is. And uh, it's very exciting to discuss it, let alone think about implementing it. So it's great. So we didn't actually ask people to have to champion this. We, they were just sort of on their own picket. So Bill's. Cl this clearly resonated with Bill. So any other comments, questions from the audience? Maybe Did table we, 14. Yeah, if 14. They are, are, you, are you sold on this? Does this seem like this is uh, again? Yep. James, please introduce yourself. Hi, I'm James Rousing. I'm the program coordinator for uh, community engagement health policy, and SFIP is one of our. It, it is our primary initiative. I think one of the things we're we're challenged with and something we, we spoke there's one of our coordinating council members at our table as well Amor Santiago is the notion of legacy uh, with a lot of these partnership working groups that we're working with what what do we leave behind what's the impact of our partnership with them and something like this sustainable uh, it's coming from a sustainable partnership are you know can be these personal technologies and and what you know it's part of what we leave behind and part of you know how 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 we solidify those partnerships by making investments like these. And um, I didn't want to say more about the. He really did. So thanks again. But yeah. <laughs> Introduce yourself, please. The, the uh, developments in sensors are, are really tremendous. Um, uh, it's not just going to be about phones. Uh, this is personal technologies, distributed technologies, um, embedded technologies. Your clothes are going to be sensing everything. The kind of data that we're going to be able to collect um, is going to be tremendous. And actually, the value of this um, also to us as researchers is huge because it's another avenue to get data that we couldn't otherwise get. Very high density, yeah. ambient modalities of data like, you know, environmental uh, pollutants, um, um, uh, expenditures, how people are spending their, their money, where they're going, social networking, just data that we've never had before that can enable us to ask questions that we've never been able to ask before. So there, there, there are multiple benefits, and I, I think the trick with something like this is to build it in a way that can evolve opportunities. We have no idea what technologies are coming down the pike. The business models are unclear. Uh, but I, I think we're very well placed to provide the scientific foundation and, and the, the, uh, the focus on what's really important and try and bring groups together uh, to, to go forward in a way that, that adds value all around. I think it's a great opportunity. That's great. So let's, uh, we're going to have to move. I'm going to give Bill a final word if, if I could. Yeah. And, and I just want to be really clear that if I understand Table 14 correctly, the phone is only part of this. There's so many other kinds of technologies that are out there. Some of them are already proven. And just give you one example of the potential where I don't think the business models are all that far from, from being implemented. You go to a large manufacturer 
who provides health insurance for their employees, and you find a way through a simple app and technologies that they already have for their workplace to remind them of their medicines or to do this sort of thing, you're going to decrease the expenditures of that healthcare uh, enterprise for that corporation. They will pay handsomely uh, for you to advance that technology, prove it, and scale it. So I think the potential partners in the sustainability is huge, uh, probably more than any of the ideas we've talked about so far. That's, that's just my app going off telling me it's time to stand up and stretch. Okay, all right. Um, just joking. All right. Next, uh, brilliant. Uh, the balanced surgeon. Uh, June, I was, as our kind of early translational expert, you did a beautiful job of sort of uh, advocating for the sense of surgeon engagement. Do you, do you want to add to that or the sustainability argument? Yeah, and, and I, I'm not sure that the, the table that came up with this idea was limiting it to device development. In fact, yeah. that the, you know, there's that would be that would be confining what sur our surgeons do more yeah. than I like. But uh, uh, but I, I do think the the dynamics around how devices get developed it is very different from how therapeutics get involved get developed, and therefore that special perspective, clinical expert perspective that surgeons bring is one that's valued by potential industry partners in a very different way than target identification in the therapeutic space, which is why I think making, and because uh, surgeons have very different kind of demands on their clinical time that, that precludes them from being able to participate in a lot of the training and training opportunities and, uh, and other opportunities that are offered, thinking through what those limitations are and trying to engage that community in a more active way would be of great value, I think. Yeah, sweet. Uh, Dr. Brenda, uh, stop typing so you can answer a question here. All right, we got. What you, you've gotten surgeons involved at the Institute for Health Policy Studies on sort of thinking in a way that I think is rare at an academic health center. Have surgeons involved? Do you want to comment on your approach to engaging the surgical community in these research activities? Well, one of the uh, leaders that we have on our campus is Kevin Bozick, who has recognized that if you don't engage patients in shared patient decision making around surgery that you may actually be uh, losing the opportunities to improve outcomes and reduce costs. So he and Jeff Belcora, another IHPS faculty member and also a member of the surgery department, are joined together in an RWJ funded project to see whether having an opportunity to inform patients, getting them engaged and understanding what the potential outcomes will be if they decide to do back surgery or not do the back surgery and quality of life. So I, I really think that shared decision making is a very important part of this and it's very transferable to other um, areas of medicine as well and, and public health. with joint appointments and things like that, I mean, at the policy level. Uh, other, other folks from that table or, so, yeah, please, yeah, introduce yourself again, please. Um, I'm Tara Karamlu and I'm a pediatric heart surgeon that just recently joined the faculty and our advocate did a great job in um, elucidating our proposal, but I think our initiative actually is a much broader pronged initiative. And really what we meant by the balanced surgeon is trying to develop um, a method whereby we could uh, pioneer a model which we could then successfully disseminate to allow the application of surgical trials in in, our, in America, and really, in, from a pediatric heart surgeon perspective, we have one successful clinical trial in the last 50 years, a randomized clinical trial. Mm -hmm. And that is because of the limitations that surgeons have. And I think if we could package a way to um, sell methodology or develop methodology to standardize and overcome the barriers, which are the heterogeneity in the delivery of care. So a surgical trial is limited because surgeons are all different. And so it's not just a drug that you're trying to evaluate. It's a surgical, sometimes a surgical technique. And so trials are confounded by that. It's also limited by personnel. Junior faculty have a lot of demands as they're on their time as we elucidated. So what we are actually proposing is a way to allow junior faculty access to resources, a consortium-based uh, research methodology and a way to train and standardize uh, clinical trials in a broader surgical sense. So, so it's a so while, while I'm up, look, let me just so make then 30 seconds on the sustainability case. Uh, would the surgical community 
sort of put skin in the game to support this from the investigator? Is there a sense that there's external funding that, that yeah, would support this? Yeah, I think um, I'll, I'll just give you a quick anecdote. There is in, again, my particular field, there is something called the Pediatric Heart Network, which is they have an RFA about every three years, and there are nine centers that have successfully submitted and gained um, basically uh, they are part of this nine center consortium. So if you can develop a way to get a successful initiative launched, you have access to NIH funding. You also will have access to device companies wanting to partner with your center okay. right. if you have successfully done a clinical trial okay, patients gonna, we've just gonna, talked okay. about. So I think there's a lot of I'm sustainability. Gonna, all right, this year, I'm gonna, I think we have five minutes. I wanna do the last one, so I'm gonna arbitrate. Although it is, on those clinical trials, the randomized trials, it's always a trip when you wake up with a sham scar on your chest. Uh, I don't know. I'm just, I don't know. All right. Uh, the um, early translational research. Uh, Elizabeth, yes. yeah. yeah. What, um, I, I, well, I would like to hear a little bit from Table 19, who, okay. who, who came up with this idea. But I mean, I think it's, it is, um, on the face of it, at least a very um, creative effort to kind of bring together um, around early translational research, a variety of partners who would all contribute from the get-go, um, the financial support to make it to make it happen. It also then has the the downstream effect of potentially generating um, income itself through the through the entity. So, um, I guess if we could ask Table Nineteen. Yeah, to anybody want to speak up for this one? Are there Table Nineteen? I'm here. In Hi, I'm Hi. Tracy Strickroth from CTSI. Um, I work in the participant recruitment service, actually. Um, but we uh, thought of this idea just because we've seen the success of um, early translational research and the T1 program. And we thought that um, basically what was talked about earlier this morning about building a, um, a for-profit business within a nonprofit umbrella. And we really liked that idea and thought that this is the most promising program to do that. Um, by creating a nonprofit, academic, as well as industry partnership. And we thought that we could get buy-in from patient advocacy groups to um, support the research and collaborate that way. So that's kind of the idea how it came from. June, is this fit? Yeah, do you want to comment? Yeah, so, so I, I can make a comment sort of there. In terms of, um, you know, what's going on in the T1 Cattles program and, and more broadly in the early translational research, efforts within CTSI, there is a lot of engagement uh, with the external world, including the industry. And this is uh, based on a number of different, a number of different things that are going on in the world around this. And one of which is that the industry is looking more and more towards uh, academia to enable its development pipeline for a lot of reasons, which we don't need to go into here. And we do believe that a place like UCSF is uniquely positioned to be uh, a, a productive collaborator and partner in that endeavor. So we are um, out there and we have people coming to us to find more creative ways to partner and collaborate and co-develop co and, and a, a variety of different sort of models. Yeah, last uh, comment, Deborah. So I like and maybe Victoria or uh, others could comment on this, but uh, I guess I'm not seeing the value of uh, having a a company within our T1 program. So I mean, there probably are some reasons why that would be helpful, but it'd be nice if somebody could explain those. Is there any? Is there a 30 second answer to why a company is uh, a distinct company as a Bill? Yeah, I. Uh, who? What, who? Victoria. But, oh, all right. All right. Was it okay? We have, we do have our expert. All right, but it's so the shortest way to say this is there's been a lot of work with philanthropists, just a handful of them, right? Giving enough money to organizations that they can develop drugs, and when those organizations have leads and their vaccines and devices and diagnostics too, when these nonprofit organizations step forward to engage with for-profit companies. They're negotiating with one arm and one leg tying behind their back. I mean, it really is, um, you're a nonprofit and you're not about profit, so our deal terms in engaging you, I mean, this is just one of the reasons, um, we don't speak the same language. So having a for-profit entity that speaks the same language, for-profit to for-profit, that is fully owned or majority owned or whatever, and full control, we didn't talk about how to control 
this for profit. And, and that, was, that, has been, that was one of my issues over time, and it's been an issue with even some board members and with governance questions, is how to not lose control. Okay? But we're talking about getting on the same level footing and negotiating and offering licenses and, and deal terms for profit to for profit, right? Which probably means different individuals even, right? We have cultures in academia and in nonprofits that lead us to prioritize mission over other things, right? And that's very important. But when you're doing business, you need to really do business. We need people to do business for us. And I, I believe we can do better. We can do, we can do better than we have done. And this is an experiment. I think our time is. I think that allows us to come full circle, sort of bringing you back to the panel and Victoria's contributions there. So, um, you know, Minnie called me up to propose this, and I thought, where's Minnie? I thought, what an absolutely insane idea this is going to be for a session. Um, and and it's true, this was wonderfully insane. But weren't these tremendous ideas? I can't believe how people in such a short time, you know, on this little index card and with our panelists trying to make sense of these scribbles came out with a really stimulating discussion about some really good ideas. I, I, I'm really impressed. So bravo to Minnie and Rachel for organizing and to all of you for making sense out of all this.